All right, Josh. Now, do you believe that the United States and India have good relations? In general, yeah. All right, excellent. Do the United States, does the United States and India have, do they have policies together? Uh, we have lots of policies, of course. All right, excellent. Do you believe that we negotiated to have those policies? Mm -hmm. But the negotiations in and of themselves weren't policies. But the once they became enacted, they became but policy. The but the negotiations led to the policies, correct? Uh, but the point is, is that no, negotiations. Back to my question. The negotiations oftentimes led to the policies, correct? Sure. That doesn't contradict that. All right. How many times has the United States negotiated with India specifically, and they have, those negotiations have not led to actual policies? Uh, well, I can't give you that number. I can give you at least one example in the area of totalization. Okay, but there's no other realm or sphere of a policy where we've negotiated with India and we have not signed a policy, correct? Um, I'm sure there is, but I haven't well, researched that because it's irrelevant to our case. Okay, interesting. All right, now under uh, one of your arguments, you stated that we're helping businesses, we're helping workers, we're helping yes. America overall, right? Absolutely. All right, how many businesses are, are we actually helping? Well, we'd be uh, helping an untold amount of businesses. But right, can you tell us that amount? Well, well, it's an unlimited potential because the way okay, I see limit that potential so we can actually know. Well, we could give you, I could give you examples of companies if you like. Is that what you're looking for? Well, I'd like a more uh, significant number of companies. Right, and my answer is that we can't quantify that because we don't know how many entrepreneurs have been discouraged from starting a company with foreign operations because of the double taxation that would make his business not So basically you're saying that there's a problem that we're solving for, but we don't know how many people are actually being affected. Well, we do know that there's going to be at least 100,000 employees affected, and then their right. businesses, their employers will be affected, and then, again, there's right. this Specifically, amount. though, you're talking about businesses, how these businesses, how they are operating, how right. they are employing the individuals, sending them overseas, mm -hmm. etc. But you provided no numbers on the actual businesses, not the employees, but you provided no numbers on how many actual businesses, businesses will be affected. Right, and I'm saying we can't quantify that because... So we only have 80,000 individuals, because then that's it. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we can't quantify the number of businesses that we're affecting because it's so large. We can't know how many entrepreneurs have been discouraged from starting a business with foreign operations. Okay, specifically only 80,000 entrepreneurs have been affected. No, 80,000 80, Indian workers in the U.S., 30,000 workers in India. So 100,000 entrepreneurs have been affected. No, not entrepreneurs. These are workers. We're talking about, if you're asking about businesses, then we, don't, we can't quantify that number. Okay, we so can't quantify cannot, the workers. You cannot quantify the number. Excellent. Right, because it's so large. All right, now you would agree that the evidence you're talking about on the time span of the uh, of the H1B visas, etc. It did did it not say that these the H1B visas led to many of these Indians Indians achieving green cards? Right. Here's the problem. Once the visa no. expires, right? Actually, to answer my question, right. it did lead to many Indian Indians getting green cards, correct? No, because here's the problem. When we, when their visa what? expires, they have to go home, which means that they have to restart their ten years of permanent residence. The evidence does not say that many of the Indians who have these H-1B visas, they achieved those green cards as a result. My, that's irrelevant. My point is that okay. they have to restart the 10 years of permanent residency and still can't claim the benefits for that pain into. All right, we're out of time. Thanks. Currently, Indian and American workers, as well as businesses, are being treated unfairly before the law. This discrimination within our legal code allows the exploitation of workers and businesses, which violates justice. As you go back to the judges' lounge to fill out your ballot, I'd ask that you evaluate each of the arguments that have arisen in today's round based on that criterion of justice. We believe that whichever team has better upheld this criterion should win your ballot. Let's start off looking at three different voting issues. First, we're going to see that exploitation is occurring and that it is significant. Secondly, we're going to be seeing that totalization works. And finally, we're going to be examining the pro-American policy of totalization. So let's start off with the first one, that exploitation is occurring. This violation of justice is significant. My first subpoint is that Indians are exploited. $1.5 billion is being paid annually to the U.S. Social Security Administration by 80,000 Indian workers. This, these statistics and empirical evidence have not been contested. Our evidence from the National University of Singapore and government research data show that they are being doubly taxed but are ineligible for benefits. Now, the employers are also often sending their employees overseas, so some of these workers don't even have a choice. The negative team says that just because they work here despite double taxation means that, and because they're not complaining, means that it must not be unjust. But they are complaining. India is pushing for a totalization agreement. Our workers are upset about it. And secondly, put yourself in the shoes of an overseas worker who has to pay dual tax contributions for the same job, the same earnings. You're paying into two social security systems, but you're only eligible for benefits in one. That 
Ask yourself if that is just. The answer is clearly it is not. My second sub-point is that Americans are exploited. 30,000 Americans are being taken advantage of by the Indian government, paying hundreds of millions of dollars into their social security system, which they cannot benefit from. Again, this statistic was never refuted. Both, both the Indian and American governments are basically telling workers and businesses that we've got what it takes to take what you've got, and you can't do anything about it. The third point is that businesses are being exploited. This point was never refuted by the negative team. Businesses and entrepreneurs are being discouraged from having companies with foreign operations because of the overbearing tax system. This results in an economic loss to the United States, an economic loss that cannot be, uh, that can, we can't be overestimated in our current economic situation. We need every economic gain that we can. We must vote affirmative. Let's look at the second voting issue. That is the totalization works. My first sub-point is that we have a change in policy. Policy expert ambassador to the UN said that negotiations aren't a policy. And we can see clearly that our current course of action is a course of action that defrauds Indian workers. So by changing that policy toward a policy of totalization, we have clearly uphold our resolutional burden. My second sub-point is that the status quo isn't solving the problem. Since the U.S. won't budge on its 10-year permanent residency requirement and won't allow the repatriation of contributions, the status quo negotiations are failing to solve the injustice. Now, the most recent evidence from the affirmative team was from January 2009 that says the U.S. is unwilling to reduce restrictions. This barrier was never refuted by the negative team. India's uh, Social Security Amendment is irrelevant to the negotiations and totalization to the United States. We can clearly see that governments are not only doubly taxing workers and businesses, but now they're taxing our patients with their endless negotiations. The negative team has advocated a bureaucratic mire of negotiations that have been stuck in gridlock for three years. That's why we must have greater urgency to enact an affirmative ballot. My third point is that there's no adequate evidence to reject the affirmative plan. The negative's arguments can be broadly summarized as fear-mongering. They want you to fear enacting a policy but give you no reason for doing so. None of their evidence said that totalization agreement, signing a totalization agreement now as opposed to later would have any negative effect. Even the negative's own evidence that said that it could be signed soon implied that signing it soon wouldn't be a problem. Finally, the only evidence in today's round regarding time says that it must be enacted more urgently. And under our solvency point two, greater urgency is required for totalization based on the Belgian model. We must sign it now. My fourth sub-point is that the Belgian model works. The specifics of the Belgian model were provided in our 1AC. We're enacting a totalization agreement broadly along the similar lines as with Belgium. The leading world expert on totalization and social security agreements, Professor Rukul Asher, former social security official, supports it and says it will work. Finally, we see that totalization is a pro-American policy. We're improving our economy, we're helping businesses. We improve the profitability of American businesses by allowing them to compete in the global economy. As the Social Security Administration and Professor Mukul Asher all agree that justice is encouraged through fair and competitive trade. That is why we must enact a totalization agreement without any further delay. Thank you.